Thank you for joining us for this life-changing message from River of Life. If you are ever in our area, we would love for you to join us. For more information, click the link down below or download our app in the App Store under ROL Crawfordville. Now let's join our special guest as he teaches from the Word of God. Wow, this is a good-looking congregation. Uh, My name is Kyle Jones, and I'd like to welcome you this morning. I know a lot of you because I work on the usher team. Most of uh, most Sundays, you'll see me in the back helping folks uh, get seated. And what I what I love about being an usher is we get to meet so many people uh, as they come into the church. And in fact, if I have not met you personally. Uh, I want to meet you. Uh, Find me on a Sunday, a Wednesday, uh, or even a Monday night prayer and introduce yourself. Uh, And I think I speak for everybody who serves in this church. They want to get to know you too. We're a large church and we're growing, but we're also a family and families get to know each other. Uh, But I'm excited to be here. Uh, Today could not have gotten here fast enough. You see, a a little over a year ago, I felt like the Lord put it on my heart uh, to preach. And I'll be the the first to admit to you, uh, I feel way underqualified at times. And uh, there's a lot of times before I come up here, I just feel like I have no no clue uh, what I'm doing. And uh, if someone were to come up to me and say, Kyle, I know, I know the schooling that you have. I know the experience that you have. I just don't think you're qualified to, to stand up on the pulpit and preach. I would, I would quickly say to them, I agree with you 100%. <laughs> but I would also say to them that it is not about our qualifications. It's not about our limitations or our experience or even our lack of experience. When it comes to doing what God puts on your heart, it is about His qualifications. And it's about what He did on the cross 2,000 years ago. Uh, my daughter, uh, my daughter Molly Bowell, many of you know her, she told me a couple uh, of weeks ago, she said, uh, she said, Dad, she said, God doesn't always call the qualified. He qualifies the called. So if God is calling you to do something, if God is putting it on your heart to do something, he will qualify you to do it. But um, so from time to time, I get the opportunity to come up here. And, and speak. And there is, like I said, there is nothing that I in, enjoy doing more uh, than this. But here, here's the problem. When the Lord puts it on your heart to preach, it's got to come out. And I'm up here every few months, and what do I do in between those times I get to, I get to speak? Well, I usually, unfortunately, I look to my family as a sounding board. And uh, I'll just tell you, my family does not cooperate with me. I usually try to preach to my wife. That lasts about 30 seconds, and she walks, walks out of the room. I try to preach to my kids. Um, they, use, they usually roll their eyes and say, Dad, not, not again. So that doesn't work. There is only one member in my family that will let me preach to them as much as I want to preach, and that is my chocolate lab moose. <laughs> now, now, many of you uh, know Moose, and I'm just going to tell you, he is, he's dumb as a box of rocks. <laughs> but Moose will do something that no friend or family will do. He will sit in front of me, and he will lock his eyes on me. And he will not take his eyes, and I can preach to him all I want. I can even preach the same message to him multiple times, and he acts just as interested every time I preach, I preach to him. And, and I know you're not going to believe me. So help me. I think he said amen the other day as I was, uh, as I was preaching. So I don't know how all that works with animals, but I'm confident Moose is going to be in heaven uh, with me one day with as much preaching as he's had to to listen to. Uh, The title to my message this morning is a now mentality. And we're going to be reading out of the book of Joshua here in just a few minutes. But let's, uh, let's first talk about the importance 
of a now mentality when it comes to the things of God and uh, or doing when a now mentality when God puts something on your heart. In my opinion, the absence of a now mentality in believers and in people today is one of the most dangerous things affecting a move of God in our world, uh, in our world today. We serve a God of the now. And when God puts something on our hearts, when He moves us, He expects us to take action then. Uh, otherwise, we run the risk of not being able to, to, uh, for those promises of God to be fulfilled in our life, and we run the risk of missing our window of opportunity on what God has, uh, has put, on, put on our heart. There was a, a character in the Bible who understood just how completely, how powerful God was, and uh, Joshua's life was characterized with a now mentality. Many of you are familiar with Joshua. He took over leadership uh, from Moses of the people of Israel. Jo uh, Joshua's job, what, he, what his uh, purpose was, was to lead the people of Israel into the lands that God had, had promised them. And Joshua lived his life with a sense of urgency and a sense of uh, uh, a decisiveness when it came to, uh, to the things of God. But as Joshua approached the end of his life, what had happened as the people of Israel had expanded into new territories, into new areas, and they were, there were outside cultures that the people of Israel began to be influenced by, people who did not believe in God. And uh, the people of Israel, some of them began to adopt unholy practices and began to do things that were displeasing to the to, to God. Sounds, sounds a little familiar today, doesn't it, with, with uh, I think, what we struggle with uh, in our church, in our church today. I want to, let's read, I'm going to, I typically don't read this much scripture, but I want to read, uh, read to you, if you'll turn with me or go to, on your phones to Joshua 23, uh, and I think they're going to pull it up as well, Joshua 23, verse 1, and we'll read through 1 through 5, and then we're going to jump to 14 and 15. After a long time had passed, and the Lord had given Israel rest from all their enemies around them, Joshua, by then a very old man, summoned all Israel, their elders, leaders, judges, and officials, and said to them, I am very old. You yourselves have seen everything the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. It was the Lord your God who fought for you. Remember how I have allotted as an inheritance for your tribes all the land of the nations that remain, the nations I conquered between the Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea in the west. The Lord your God himself will push them out for your sake. He will drive them out before you and you will take possession of their land as the Lord your God promised you. And then in verse 14, Now I'm about to go the way of all the earth. You know with all your heart and soul that not one of all the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. But just as all the good things the Lord your God has promised you have come to you, so he will bring you bring on you all the evil things he has threatened until the Lord your God has destroyed you from this good land he has given you if you violate the covenant of the Lord your God. And then he it's a by the way, I encourage you go to Joshua 23 and 24. It is a great passage. Uh, to read. And then let's go to, this is probably what most of you are familiar with, Joshua 24, verse 15. And then Joshua put a declaration out to the, to the people of Israel. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And the scripture says that on that very same day that Joshua made a covenant 
for the people uh, of Israel and the people made the covenant with Joshua. They reaffirmed their commitment to the Lord. Joshua understood the importance of a now mentality and a sense of urgency when it comes to the things of God. We have a... uh, We have a couple in this church uh, by the name of uh, Anthony and Nano um, Chavez. And they live in New Mexico, but they spend their winter months... Uh, they spend their winter months uh, here, and I just connected with them from the from the time they they joined the church. And one day I was walking through the lobby, and I walked by Anthony and Nano, and I just casually mentioned to them to pray for me about something. I really don't even remember what it was. And Anthony looked at me and he said, "Well, there's no need to wait. Let's just do it right now." And so he kind of gathered some people around and just lifted me up in prayer, and it was just an awesome experience. And then shortly. Before they went to, uh, to back to New Mexico, we were standing out in the parking lot after a service, and we were just talking. We were just sharing with each other how we came to Christ. And Anthony and Nanu, they shared with me just a beautiful story of how their daughter Alejandra got saved. And Alejandra began witnessing and sharing the love of Christ. And every time she was around them, she was telling them about Jesus and and just really witnessing to her parents until one day, Anthony and Nano's hearts were moved and they invited Christ into their heart. And when they did, they went all in for the Lord. And and then um, Nano looked at me, and this is, this is uh, what really touched me. And I, and I don't know that I'll ever be the same after this, this conversation. Nano looked at me, and she said, but Kyle, we were late. We were later in life when we came to know Christ. And she said, my parents had already passed. And she said, I will do anything she said, if I, could just, if I could just go back in time, if I could just roll back the clock five minutes to go back and to share Christ with my parents, oh, I would love, love to do that. And then Anthony looked at me with an intensity and a, and a passion unlike I'd ever seen, and he said, Kyle, we have to tell people about Christ when we, when we have the chance. Anthony and Nano Chavez, they understand that life is short, that we are not guaranteed tomorrow, and they are living their lives today with a now mentality and a sense of urgency when it comes to the things of God. I want to talk with you about someone else who has lived their life with a a now mentality. And in just a moment, I'm going to pull up a picture. This This may not work. This may not. What's the old expression about going over like a a lead balloon? This may absolutely not work, so forgive me. But what we're going to do is I'm going to pull up a picture here in a minute, and here's the game. We're going to see if you can recognize anybody in this photo. The photo is 55 years old. You know, it's hard to recognize. You know, you look 55 years ago. That's a long. That's a long time. Okay, uh, sound booth. Go ahead and pull up the pull up the photo. You recognize anybody in the photo there? <laughs> okay, let me, let me tell you who, who this is, who these, who these men are. This is my family. On the left-hand side is my Uncle Bernard Brooks. Beside him is my Uncle Franklin Jones. That is my grandmother, Nanny Bet uh, Jones. Beside her is my, is my grandfather, Frank Jones. Directly behind him is my Uncle Merwin Jones. He's in the service today. And that is my father, Henry Jones, in the front, which I believe he was a junior in high school when that picture was taken. And then... And then, and then beside him is my uncle J. D. John David Jones to the to the far right. Now I don't know about you when I when I look at that picture, I cannot help but just to feel sorry for my grandmother. <laughs> you you have no idea you have no idea what she had to deal with 
with six alpha males under under the same roof. Now, uh, I'm just going to give you a real super quick story just to kind of give you a little taste of what uh, what my grandmother had to had to deal with. Now, my family, we were not they were not wealthy. But my grandfather was a traveling salesman, and he traveled all over the United States, and he was deeply in love with my grandmother. He loved her just uh, uh, his whole life. He just loved her so much. And uh, he was at the New York World's Fair in the, I think it was in the early 1960s. And at this fair, I'm not sure exact, that was a big event. Every, all the popular people were there. That was a big event then. While he was there, he was able to somehow get some fine china, some crystal that belonged to Zsa Zsa Gabor. True sto- this is a true story. So Zsa Zsa Gabor was a famous actor in the 50s and 60s. Some of you more mature folks may remember Zsa Zsa, Zsa, Zsa Gabor, but she was very famous. Uh, and my grandfather was able to get this china. From what I understand, it was just absolutely stunning, just breathtaking. He brought that china back to Wakulla County, and he gave it to my grandmother. And that was her prize possession. That became her prized possession. She loved that china from Zsa Zsa Gabor, everybody. That, in fact, she loved it so much she had a special display case right beside, right beside the kitchen, and, and she would brag on it and just love that. As I said, that was, a, that was her, prize, her prized possession. Now, I don't have time to go into to the whole to, to the whole story, but the, the story involves... The brothers, it involves a sawed-off 410 shotgun <laughs> and Zsa Zsa Gabor's fine china. <laughs> now, I was thinking of the best way for the sake of time to tell this story, and then I had an idea. You know, um, from time to time, for those of you, and you, you hear all of the speakers, a lot of times you'll hear many of our speakers get up here and quote poetry. You ever heard? You ever been in here when you've heard anybody, any of our speakers quote quote poetry? Now I'm I'm really not a big big fan of of poetry, um, but I don't want to be outdone <laughs> by the other speakers. So I decided to write a poem that would describe how this story ends. Okay, y'all, you want to hear it? Okay, so th- this is, so it invo- again, it involves the brothers. It, in, it involves um, uh, a 410 shotgun, sawed off 410 shotgun, and fine china by Zsa Zsa Gabor. Okay, here you go. You ready for my, my poem? I wrote this myself. You ready? All right. Zsa Zsa Gabor, China no more. So that's my poem. (laughs) Now, now today, trust me, trust me on this. You need, I'm talking about getting to know each other in this church. You need to ask my Uncle Merwin or my dad about that story or my Uncle John David if you see him around. It's a story you definitely want to hear, hear the rest of. Okay, my dad was in his early 20s, and this is where I'm going with this. My dad was in the, his early 20s. He felt a calling into the ministry. And when he was, felt like he was being called into the ministry, he, tell, he tells his father. And my grandfather disapproved. He, he, he did not give my dad his blessing. He said he was making a big mistake, said he would not be able to support his family, that he was being foolish, and did everything in his power to try to encourage my dad not to go into the ministry. My dad did not, um, uh, my dad went to the ministry anyway, as you know. He loaded up, he moved away. And against the wishes of his father. Uh, uh, Sometime later on, uh, we were not here, so we were several hours away. My dad is driving down the road, and he feels 
feels that, you know how the Lord speaks to you. You know when you, when you just feel something. When we say the Lord speaks to us, sometimes it's not like an audible voice. A lot of people say it's clearer than an audible voice. The Lord put it on my dad's heart to witness to his dad. And uh, he was, my dad was in his vehicle when he got this word from the Lord. Uh, this was way before cell phones. Dad pulled into the first phone booth. He came to, goes in, puts the quarters in, calls back home. When he gets his dad on the phone, my grandfather on the phone, dad said, uh, Dad, I'm just calling to tell you that I love you. And, <clears throat> and um, he said for the first time when he talked to his dad, he heard something different. In his voice, just a just a little different. It's almost like a like a hard shell had been cracked just just a little. And that conversation led to a week later, uh, Dad traveled back home, and he walked into the living room. Now, keep in mind, Dad was in his early twenties. He probably felt underqualified when he walked in into that living uh, room that day, and he goes in and. Not knowing what to say, not really knowing what to do. He just knew he was, he was being obedient to the Lord. He walks into the living room. My grandfather and grandmother were sitting in their recliners. He gets on his knees, not knowing what to say, not knowing what to, to do. He just simply got on his knees in the middle of the floor. And he extended his hand up like this. Just, just extended his hand to his, grand, to, to his dad. And probably what's, what was a few seconds, but probably what seemed like hours. Eventually, my grandfather, he stood up out of his recliner. He walks to the center of the room. He takes my dad by his hand. He kneels. He repented of his sins, and he invited Christ into his heart. And then... And then... I think it was a week or maybe two weeks later, my grandfather, right here in Wakala County, he walked down into Pigott's Pond, and he was baptized by another local, local pastor. Things like that do not happen without a now mentality. And I'm getting, getting close here, but... Um, I, want to, I, I wanted to share with you a story. Many of you may have heard this story, but it really impresses the point here, the significance of having a now mentality. Um, but I'm reminded of a, of a story of Satan. And Satan was in hell, and he called a board meeting with his most trusted and high-ranking demons. Um, and the purpose of the meeting was to have a discussion, to come up with ideas about st stopping the spread of Christianity. Satan opens up the meeting. He said, hey, we've got to come up with some new ideas. We want to stop the spread of the gospel. We want to stop people from taking action when, when um, um, that they feel like God is impressing on them to do something. I need some ideas. And so one, boy, one demon spoke up and he said, I have an idea. Why don't we tell people that Jesus was not the Son of God and he was not the Savior of the world? And Satan thought on that a second. He said, you know, that'll work. That may work for some, but eventually people will see through that lie. Because there just is no explaining the life that he lived, his miracles, uh, uh, his sacrifice on the cross. I just, that, that's not going to work. We need something. We need something different. Then another demon spoke up a few seconds later, and he said, why don't we tell people that the Bible is not true? That is false. And Satan thought on that a second. He said, that may work for some, but he said, you know, we've been trying for hundreds of years to discredit the Bible unsuccessfully. Even as science advances, all, that, all science is doing is even validating that the Bible is true. Eventually, people will see through that lie as well. We need something different. We need something that will uh, be more effective to a, to, you know, to, a, to a broader number of people. And then another demon spoke up and said, I got it. Why don't we tell people that they do not need to be saved? That they do not need to invite Jesus into their heart. And they do not need to repent of their sins. Satan thought on that for a second. And he said, you know, he said, that may work for some, 
But he said the problem with that is, is deep inside the core souls of people. People know they need to change. People know they need a Savior. He said, that's just, that won't work. We need something more subtle. And then a, then a demon spoke up who hadn't said anything the whole meeting. And he said, hey, I've got a, I have an idea. Why don't we tell people that Jesus is the Son of God? Why don't we tell people that the Bible is true, that everything in it is accurate? And why don't we even tell people that, yes, you do need to invite Jesus into your heart. You do need to listen to him. You do need to follow his direction. Why don't we tell people that all of those things are true? But let's whisper in their ears, just don't do anything today. Just don't do anything today. There's always tomorrow. And a sinister grin came across Satan's face. And he said, brilliant. He said, that's it. He said, if we can convince people that there is always tomorrow, then they, by the time they get ready to make a decision, it'll be, it'll be too late. Joshua, 3,200 years ago, stood before the people of Israel and said, God has done everything he said he would do. Every promise has been fulfilled. But there are still battles that need to be fought. There's still work to be done. And God wants to give you those lands that He's promised you. But it's time to make a decision where you stand. It's time to, to, to decide once and for all that you're fully committed to the Lord, and the time to make that decision is today. The time to make that decision is now. And I started thinking on that, and I started thinking, what would Joshua say? If Joshua could come down from heaven and stand on this stage in front of River of Life, what would Joshua say to River of Life? And you know, I think Joshua would say essentially the same thing. I think he would give the same message. But I don't think he would be talking about conquering new lands or conquering new territories. I think Joshua would, would take this Bible and I think he'd hold it up and he'd, he would say, all of God's promises in this Bible are coming true are coming true. Everything in this Bible is accurate. But there are still battles that need to be fought in each and every one of you. And God will go in front of you and fight those battles for you if you claim, if you claim His promises. And He wants to give you everything that's promised in this Bible. And I think Joshua would remind us I think Joshua would remind us of many of the promises in, in the Bible. And there's so many of them. But, uh, but sometimes we just need reminding, don't we? Sometimes we just need remi reminding of what God promises. For example, in the, in the book of Isaiah, God promises us His presence. Fear not, for I am your God. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. In the book of Philippians, God promises us His provision. My God will supply all of your needs based on the riches of His glory in Christ Jesus. How about this one? In the book of Proverbs, God promises us His guidance. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not into your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. In the book of 1 John, God promises us forgiveness. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then again, in the book of Philippians, God promises us His strength and His help. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And then what about this one? Uh, in the book of John, 
God promises us his peace. My peace I give you. I do not give to you what the world gives you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. And then I really like this one. What about in the book of 1 Corinthians where God promises us victory over temptation? God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. And then many of you need to hear this one, this next one. What about this? In the book of 1 Peter, God promises us restoration. Restoration. And the God of all grace, after you have suffered a little while, will himself make you strong, firm, and steadfast. And then, and then the best of all, in John chapter 3, he promises us, he promises you eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And there are dozens and dozens and dozens of promises just like that all throughout the word of God. And I think Joshua would remind, just like he reminded the people of Israel, what God had done for them and the promises God had made to them, he would stand here, I think, and do do the same thing with us. I think he would remind us of promise after promise after promise after promise in this Bible. But I also think Joshua would say, if you want these promises to be fulfilled in your life, if you want to claim these promises, it's time to make a decision. It is time to step out and to, to make a decision and to follow, follow through with what the Lord is putting, putting on your heart. And uh, I'm, I'm wrapping up here, so if the praise team would like to come forward. You know, so many of us, we come here to church Sunday after Sunday. Wednesday after Wednesday. But you, do you want to know the truth? Uh, and Priscilla was praying this morning about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit filling this place. And you know, I was thinking, I love coming to church. This is, I love coming to church better than anything. I love listening to Derek. I love listening to all the preachers. But the truth is, most of us, most of us know deep within us what we need to do. You don't, we don't need a preacher or a teacher to stand up here and to tell you what you need to do because the truth is the Holy Spirit has a way of teaching us and guiding us and directing us much better than any preacher or any teacher. So my invitation today is very, very simple. I'm encouraging you today to just simply do what you've known you've needed to do for a very, very long time. And, um, you know, there's some of you today that you may, need to, you may need to join this church. You may need to come forward and just make it official. Join the church. There's some of you. October 6th is baptism. I think some of you may need to come forward and sign up for, for baptism. I think some of you may need to come forward and just fully recommit reestablish that covenant with the Lord just like the people of Israel did did that day after Joshua spoke with spoke with them what about this one I think could there be some people in the church that have been feeling a call into the ministry and that includes you youth could there be could you could there be some people that are feeling like God wants you to do something but you but you need to come forward and just maybe get some prayer uh, some prayer on that And there's some people, and I'm probably one of these, who needs to say, Lord, if you'll give me one more day, if you'll be gracious enough to give me one more day, I'll tell that person I love. I'll tell that person I care about Christ. Because we're not guaranteed. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. So if everybody would stand as the music plays, the invitation is simple today. And the altar, the altar is open. 
thank you again for watching our message from River of Life. If this message has touched you today, or if you need someone to pray with, please contact our office at 850-926-1200 or email us at info at rolcrawfordville.com. We also want to encourage you to visit us Sunday mornings at 1030 or Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Please visit us at rolcrawfordville.com for more information and directions.